We have a, um, we have a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for the topic that we're going to discuss because in Lynn Good, the chairman and president and CEO of Duke Energy, we have the electricity industry covered. In Doug Suttles, the president and CEO of Encana, we have the oil and gas industry covered. And in Felix Zhang, co-founder and group executive director for Envision Energy, we have the batteries and internet of things and renewables market covered. So we're going to cover an entire industry and an entire world in 31 minutes, which is, which is, which is very exciting. Um, Lynn, I want to start with you. And if you would um, very briefly first give a, a very high overview of where the electric utility industry is today, and then talk about how you're thinking about renewals, uh, renewables as the first part of how we'll talk about the energy poverty gap. You know, Adam, I would describe the electric utility industry as an industry undergoing transformation. Uh, it's being driven by technology innovation, digital solutions, customer expectations in a way that is driving a lot of change. And renewables are at the center of it. Today, renewables represent about 17% of the energy that's produced in the U.S., and I see that increasing over time. And just briefly tell us what the, the major factors into that 17% are. For, for Duke, if you will. Sure. I think policy has been important. No, I'm Adam. sorry. I meant the components. So, you know, coal would be the non-renewables. Non yeah, so solar, wind, and biomass. Uh, and in the southeastern part of the U.S., it's heavily solar. In the Midwest, it's heavily wind. And I think it was, uh, you know, early on, policy was the big uh, producer or the push for renewables in the U.S. And now I think price and preference of customers and large corporations are really driving further growth. So we see this as uh, an increasing part of our business, and we're investing in infrastructure to support that, which means investment in our delivery system to make it smarter, more accommodative of renewable technologies. Policy is a very complicated topic. It's complicated for, for an electric utility holding company. So talk a little more about that and a little more deeply on how you approach that. It's a mosaic, right, because you're dealing in multiple jurisdictions. Sure. I think policy is one of the uh, most important parts of our business, but also one of the more difficult. Because we are planning a system and an investment strategy that should work over decades, right? You're putting capital to work today that you're hoping is a good decision in 2025 and 2030. Yet policy doesn't work by decades. It can be influenced heavily by elective, um, the election cycle of two to four years. And so we are constantly focused on where can we put investment to work that we think makes sense given those policy dynamics and what we see in the external environment. So for us, it's customer focused, it's investment in the delivery system, it's clean energy, and it's natural gas infrastructure. Okay, good. We'll come back to what this room can do to help, if, if, if anything. But Doug, I want to ask you to, to give a similar overview of where the oil and gas industry stands. You, you come to the, comp, you know, the, the, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, well, they're the polluters. That's not part of the, the future of energy. That's certainly not how you see it. So please. Well, I think, you know, what's interesting about this energy dialogue is it feels very focused on the West. Um, but as the intro said, there's over a billion people in the world who live without electricity. There's three billion people in the world who actually live in energy poverty today. And just to put a contrast on that, there's only a billion people that live in Canada, the US, Europe, and Australia. So there's that many people in the entire world don't even have electricity every day. And a few other things which matter a lot in this debate is over the next 20 years, the population of the planet is supposed to grow by 2 billion people. Um, in fact, it was interesting, over my lifetime, the planet's grown 240%. When I was born, it was 3 billion people. Today, it's 7.2. And all those people need energy, and energy is actually a core building block of life. It sits right alongside food and water. It's not a choice. It's something you have to have. And today, the global energy mix is 85% natural gas, oil, and coal. Um, I just want to, I want to pause and ask you, to repeat that because it, it's such a profound number. 85% is? 85% is natural gas, oil, and coal. And in fact, when you look at the mix, actually renewables are only 4% of the global mix. And the biggest piece of renewables is biomass. And biomass is wood and dung. Um, actually, uh, hundreds of millions of people cook their evening meal with animal waste every day today. So that's the real wor the world we live in today. Demand for oil and gas has never been higher in any point in history. We just crossed 100 million barrels a day. Um, the last three years are probably the three biggest years of growth ever. 
Um, and actually natural gas, there's about 365 billion cubic feet per day consumed, and it's actually growing rapidly. And, and we have these social concerns, there's concerns about climate, but actually what's underpinning all of this is a lot of people, hundreds of millions of people are moving out of poverty every year now. And they have to have energy. And if we deny them affordable energy, they will be stuck in poverty. So this is a big piece of this debate. And I think the way you present that is, is, is very compelling. And I want to I paraphrase it back and ask you to react, which is, you, you, if I hear you saying, yes, there are, there are all sorts of issues with, uh, with oil and gas. And we know that. That, that. That's not a secret. It's not a revelation. You have to, you, you know, you can't have everything in life. And one thing we definitely want is for these billion people to have access to electricity. And if that means that we can't solve all the pollution problems we would like immediately, so be it. Well, and, and I think that's right. But I, I think one of the things that, that we need to understand is energy has always been in transition. It, yep. it, this is not new. There, in fact, I believe there's no form of energy man's ever used that's still not being used today. And this has really been driven by this, this whole thing about availability, reliability, affordability, and social expectations. Social expectations are not new. Think back to Dickens' uh, era in London when burning coal to heat homes was creating a massive social issue. It created a health issue and, and drove change. So that is not new, but we have to get the balance right. And we shouldn't forget that the technology which has had the biggest impact on reducing CO2 emissions in the atmosphere in the last 20 years is natural gas being used for electricity. The United States is a great example. CO2 emissions are at 25-year lows. Electricity yep. prices are inexpensive. Natural gas is cheap. The economy is flourishing. And it's the only country who's meeting or beating its targets. And so your point is it, it's, um, th this progress has been made on the back of a non-renewable fuel. Okay, good. Let, 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 let's pause there. F Felix, I'd like you to start by explaining to everyone, I think your company Envision would be the least well-known of, of, of the three. First, just tell us what you do, and then we'll talk about renewable energy. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I forgive, you know, most people don't know who Envision is, and uh, we're 12 years old, Shanghai-based. Uh, we dedicate our efforts on uh, energy transformation to build a sustainable uh, environment for the mankind, and that's our mission, and uh, we believe that this whole energy transformation from a fossil fuel-based uh, fuel energy system to a renewable-based energy system will take multiple decades. And uh, there are two key challenges, and uh, we summarize that, you know, whatever we do, if you look at the energy uh, system transformation, um, first is the cost of energy and uh, how we continue to uh, leverage technology innovations and digital solutions to continue to drive LCOE, levelized cost of energy, and for renewables to uh, a very competitive price, which is the case in a lot of part of the world. And second is what we call that cost of synergy. And cost of synergy is what we um, believe. How do we enable 100% renewables combining from generation side to the demand side, and including all the electrification, transportation, heatings, and cooling systems? So those are the two key challenges we see. And Envision only focus on three plus one product. It used to be three, now we have another one. And first is we make smart wind turbines. It's energy IoT based. And um, last year we had 8.2 gigawatts auto book and put us number two globally. And this year is over 10 gigawatts. I think we should be global number one. And, and what uh, are your top markets for wind turbines? Uh, still China, because China is 40% global market share for uh, for wind um, for wind uh, market. And uh, but we're very active globally as well in Europe, in uh, Latin America, and many other countries. Second product is what we call that energy IoT platform, um, which you mentioned earlier. And uh, we are we are by far probably the leaders in uh, in the renewable uh, energy IoT digital solution space. We're managing 120 gigawatts wind farms primarily, and uh, that's about 15% global market shares of wind farms is using Envision software systems. And we Good, I wanted you to clarify that. When you say IoT systems, that means software for people who are running, in this case, wind farms, but it can also be Running wind farms, advanced analytics, forecasting, yep. um, <laughs> preventative maintenance, pretty comprehensive system. Yep. We also introduced what we call the energy, en energy operating system, NOS, which is helping uh, from generation to demand side, orchestrating the, 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 the harmonization of the, the energy system. Mm -hmm. The third is we also uh, independent IPPs. Uh, um, we build two gigawatts wind farms and solar farms every year. And we majority own that, and uh, it's in China, in France, in Argentina, Mexico, and India. 
So we're very active and owning uh, wind farms and solar farms as well. Last but not least is in August, we have acquired Nissan and NEC battery systems. So we are now uh, top five in the world in terms of uh, battery solutions for EVs and uh, energy storage solutions as well. Okay, good. We're going we're gonna to come back to that. Lynn, I want to ask you first, talk about, uh, Felix mentioned the kind of technology that his firm provides. Talk about the kind of technology that you're using. Sure. And what's new about it? Well, I think digital technology we look at as an enabler for this transformation. As I think about the world that we're facing, uh, being more productive with our existing assets is incredibly important, and there are digital solutions that help us do that. Um, operating our system differently to take advantage of uh, new resources that are being added and new technologies, and also to enable what our customers want. So we are focused on digital solutions around our assets, so preventative maintenance sensors everywhere uh, to figure out how to best use our capital. We're also putting digital solutions in the hands of our employees so that we're operating our system more effectively, and then, of course, our customers so that they have the kind of experience they want to have. Can you um, drill down a little bit on that transformation? What, what's the Generally, what's the time period? And talk about the education process of teaching those three constituencies, your customers, your employees, and I'm trying to remember the third thing you said. Assets. And, and, yes. and, and redoing your assets. Yes. To, to learn to do that kind of technology. I think it's ongoing, Adam. So um, you know, we are trying to move as aggressively as we can to introduce mobile technologies and digital technologies to take advantage of the data that we have in our system to operate in this new world. But I would say every time we put one application in place, we have another five we'd like to pursue. Mm -hmm. And so you're in a, a constant uh, a battle to keep pace, and you're trying to ensure that you're operating your system in a way that makes the most sense for your customers. It's reskilling, it's hiring employees yeah. with greater digital capability, and it's making smart investments on a system of our size uh, to pilot, understand how it can be effective, and then scale it. Um, Doug, the oil and gas industry has always been technologically has advanced, has used a lot of technology. Talk about how you're thinking about that topic now. Yeah, you, you know, if you, if you look at the history of oil and gas, it's actually been driven by only two things, the geopolitics, which is access to resource and technology, and it never stops. So, you know, we actually believe our business is fundamentally an innovation process because ultimately um, what's fascinating in our world is the most important thing in our world is the price of our product, and it's the one thing we have no control over. <laughs> so the only thing we have control over is the efficiency at which we develop and produce that product. So what we're constantly trying to figure out is how to do that better. Um, and it's constantly moving with technology. Today, the, the, for instance, the digital revolution, if you went out to one of our, our natural gas or oil sites today, you'd find our production operators run off an iPad. We have two control centers, one here in in Canada and Grand Prairie, Alberta, and another in Denver, Colorado, which 24 hours a day monitors and controls every well we drill today. Um, so what's changing is our workforce, which used to be thought of as big burly people with hairy knuckles that drag the ground. Um, it's now actually people that actually do occasionally have to wear hard hats and, and steel-toed boots and drive pickup trucks. But actually, it's incredibly digital, and it's all about efficiency. And that efficiency is about cost, and it's about impact. It's about how do we constantly do what we do with less impact than we did it the day before. Uh, you mentioned that prices are one thing you can't control, but you still have to think about them and, and, and forecast them. We're in, a, we're in an upswing yes. in global oil prices at, at the moment. Yes. Um, can you share what your corporate uh, outlook is and, and how you're planning accordingly? Well, for the, it, for the, and you tell me the time frame, which I think is relevant and interesting. Well, unfortunately, the prices are going to go up and down. <laughs> yeah, and they're going to well, go that's re reassuring. <laughs> and they're going to go up and down forever. I mean, I, I, you know, I've been in this industry my entire life. My dad worked in it. My grandfather worked in it. My daughter now works in it. Um, so we've been in it since the 30s. And you have that in common with the physics Nobel laureate we had <laughs> on yesterday whose daughter is a physicist, but go ahead, please. But, but, but what you learn in this industry is that it is fundamentally a commodity, um, and therefore it's going to have periods of undersupply and oversupply, and that's going to drive the price. The fascinating thing about that is the consumer has always benefited. Ultimately, this competition continue, the wealth of that competition gets transferred to the consumer. In the shorter term, I mean, what we have is a period of underinvestment, which came from low oil prices. That's what's currently causing the concern in the markets today. And then, of course, there's always the, 
um, geopolitical stability, which is causing concern in markets, and that gets priced in. Uh, excuse me, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by underinvestment. In, in North America alone, there's been massive investment in, in fracking, for example, in the last five to ten years. So where is the underinvestment you're talking about? Well, talking it, about refining and distribution. No, I'm actually talking about in the in the development and production side, which because if you if those of us in the industry remember Thanksgiving um, 2014 when OPEC met and changed their policy and said they were no longer going to manage to price, but they were going to manage to market share. And, it, and you, you may remember that in uh, March of 2016, oil went to $26 a barrel. Um, and what that caused was a massive reduction in capital spending in the mm -hmm. industry. And the effect of that is like Lynn discussed, this is actually a long cycle business. It's yep. very capitally intensive and you can't catch up quickly. So even though we're having massive amounts of investment in the United States today, and you know, to put it in perspective, the United States oil production was 5.5 million barrels a day in 2010. Today it's over 11. And this is the U.S. alone, not including Canada. That's just the United States. So that five, in fact, that five and a half million barrels of growth is more production than all of Canada, just the growth. If we had not had that growth over this time period, oil would probably be 150 to $200 a barrel. Um, and the reason that's worked is that short cycle capital, we can make quick that's decisions and put it to work, but the long cycle projects are behind uh, and that'll ultimately show up in price. I want to. I want to pivot to you, Felix, on the subject of price, because in the area where your company plays, um, you're also investing in long cycles. Yes. But every time prices uh, plummet, if, uh, I'm sorry, oil and natural gas prices plummet, there's a general dampening effect on the renewables industry, right? Because it becomes less interesting to investors and, and other factors. So talk about how you, th or if you agree, and how you think about that. Yeah. Um. Definitely, we, we actually play a long game. And from our perspective as a technology and digital solution companies, and as I mentioned, LCOE is a very strong focus of ours. So a lot of the effort has been put in to continue to drive the, the energy yield for renewable solutions. And in the meantime, drop, drop the OPEX cost for renewable solutions. And what you have seen last three years in the renewable projects globally and auctions in Mexico, Wind is trading was, was at $17.8 per megawatt hour, so much cheaper compared to, you know, even gas is trading at $2 per mm BTU, cannot produce power price at that price. And uh, we have one auction December last year in India, and uh, which is at about $35. So even any gas import or coal, uh, coal price and cannot compete even in India. So what I'm trying to say, and also in China, we work with one of the utility companies in China called SPIC, and building a six gigawatts wind farm and uh, 450 kilometer from Beijing, and uh, we will actually deliver about $2, uh, $20 per megawatt hour to, uh, to, to the capital city. So what I'm trying to say is, um, what I see in the long term with the renewables uh, coming of age, and uh, I think the volatility will drop on the commodity side, because I don't see that I'll go back above $20 anymore in a lot of countries. And uh, so, which I think is good news, you know, if we finally get to the, 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 the final consumers in the end. Do you, either, do you either agree or disagree with that? Well, I think- It's a long game though, I want yeah. to say that. I don't want to, I don't want but to say but I'd, I'd actually reinforce one of the points he's making, which is different sources of energy fit best in different places, and this is what we're already seeing. I mean, uh, fascinatingly enough, a big source of our electricity to power our oil operations in West Texas comes from wind today. Hmm. Now, wind helping produce oil, oil is a transport fuel. It's actually not a power fuel anymore. Um, and, and there isn't on the horizon technology that's gonna massively change that. For instance, most of the people in this room got here on an airplane. Airplanes are gonna need jet fuel. Uh, for the foreseeable future, and that's decades. So, so I think it's actually letting the system work in the end because we, when we look at the world today, we actually see that all of these sources, whether it's nuclear, whether it's hydro, whether it's biomass, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's natural gas, whether it's oil, they're all gonna be required. Um, and their, their piece of the mix will change, but don't forget that demand for energy is expected to grow 35% over the next 20 years. So it's not just fulfilling today's needs, we also have to add another 35% to the mix over the next 20 years. 
I want to come back to a topic that Lynn started with at the outset, which is, which is policy or government. I want to start with you, Felix, to talk about, in particular in China, the role of the government in stimulating uh, renewable energy, but also in dealing with pollution and, you know, high level, how you see that and how you play into it from a business perspective. Yeah. Um, we decided actually start Envision is because an NDRC, which is a planning agency um, in, in China, and they set the feeding tariff for wind in 2006. And uh, I think the government has been uh, actually very, um, very actually committed in uh, renewables and for multiple reasons, obviously. And uh, the feeding tariff has been there for more than 10 years, so very little change compared to many governments in the world. And that allowed actually huge boom in the renewable sectors in China. And uh, there are actually changes because now given, as I mentioned earlier, LCOE in, uh, in uh, renewables has dropped significantly over the last five years. And so there now we're actually introducing auctions and uh, introducing different regimes for wind and solar as well. So I think the policy in China has been very constructive. And uh, as I mentioned, for multiple reasons, for pollution reasons, for energy security reasons, for energy um, you know, uh, uh, demand reasons, because we have a huge demand growth in China as well. And I think going forward, and uh, they are adjusting their deregulation on the retail side. There is auction introducing the renewable side. And uh, I think it's, um, you know, government continue to be, in my view, is quite on top of it. Yeah. Let me put you on the spot and ask you to make a prediction of what, what year Will the air quality in the northern industrial cities of China be the same as the industrial cities in, in Europe and, the, and North America? Well, being, being partially from Beijing, I was hoping much earlier. Yeah, and, and <laughs> you and a lot of other people. <laughs> and I, I think it will take some time, but, but I, I do think it's improved a lot already. I, I think on year, um, year to year basis, it's improving by a few percentages every year. And this actually is a KPI for mayor of Beijing and the mayor of the surrounding cities as well. Unfortunately, with the economic slowing down now in China, and I think that requirements actually has loosened up a bit, which is which to me is not very good to see. So right. It doesn't economic slowdown does not help. Doesn't does not help. help matters. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, let me ask you. The you, you do not play in China. Um, you're you're regional, spe specifically regional. Talk about how you work with government and your, it, I'm interested to know your reaction to hearing about this, you know, national planning at the Chinese level and how that compares with the jurisdictions that you deal with. Sure. So, Adam, we operate in about 20 states in the U.S., dominant position in the southeast and the Midwest. And I would say policy in the U.S. is a patchwork, uh, very heavily influenced by the states and by the regions in which we operate. But I think as it uh, pertains to the matter of carbon, the story is a very good one in the US, uh, and certainly for Duke Energy. Our carbon emissions are down 30% from 2005, headed to 40. And it's been the result of good economic decisions, taking advantage of natural gas as we have converted from coal to natural gas, and adding renewables where they make sense. So it's been solar in the southeast, it's been wind in the Midwest. And I think we've been able to not only make great progress, but maintain prices to customers that are affordable and attractive so that our regions continue to grow economically and also work through the policy. Uh, so, you know, it kind of gets back, Adam, to that notion of I'm planning for 2025 and 2030. We believe in a lower carbon future. We believe in making economic decisions for our customers. And I think we have the resources to make good progress and work through the policy uh, as it changes in a way that just adds to what we're trying to accomplish as a corporation. If you could wave your magic wand across those 20 states and, and, and have the government do what you would like it to do, what would that be? I think one of the biggest challenges for an infrastructure company is permitting and siting. Uh -huh. So let's say I need to build a transmission line, or let's say I need to get natural gas into a region, or even in certain areas where I want to put wind or solar, you can run into permitting processes that actually double and triple the amount of time necessary to construct something. So I think the, the notion of trying to make the transformation, transformative change that we all want to accomplish whatever objective of carbon or uh, electrification or other things, you have to be able to build infrastructure. And permitting and siting can be a challenge. The United States has a president who has some extra expertise in permitting and, and, and siting. Has there been any change in that environment during his administration? So permitting and siting, unfortunately, is, isn't the sole uh, responsibility of a single agency. So you're yeah. working at the federal level, you're working at the state level, you're working across states. And uh, I, I must say, at the federal level, we've been uh, had some success over the last several years working through siting of infrastructure. Our challenge has been in the states. Your questions, please. Who would like to ask a question? 
Yeah, right in the middle, please. Just identify yourself, if you would. Good morning, Bashir Janua, CEO of uh, Calculi. We just received a new um, climate change report, which looks pretty drastic. Um, what are your thoughts? Thank you for that. Uh, go ahead, please. So I think there's great sense of urgency to move. Uh, and I look at the progress that I talked about a moment ago with 30% reduction headed to 40% for Duke Energy. That's on path for a two degree scenario. I know that the UN report actually challenged should we be working toward a degree and a half. So I think those are, um, those are certainly challenges that we can see as we plan our system. We have a clear path through 2030 and we're a big proponent of investment in research and development because I think once you get past 2030, you're looking for some technological developments that hopefully will, um, will bring that into a little clearer focus. We also believe that continuing to keep nuclear power as part of the picture is important here in the U.S., certainly important to Duke Energy. 50% of the power in the southeastern part of the U.S. that we operate in comes from nuclear. You, you have a very important voice in, in Washington. The, I think the, the, one of the points is that it's unclear if, if the White House will respond to this report, and odds are it will either not respond or it will re re reject the report. What would your advice and your request be to the White House? You know, Adam, um, when I think about the policy in the U.S., certainly federal policy is important, but if you look at the way the states are moving, whether it's the southeast or it's the west coast, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm around making progress on this, and I don't see that changing. I also think the preference of customers and corporations have a very loud voice in the U.S. as you think of the number of Fortune 500 companies that are moving toward 100% renewables. So I think there's plenty of momentum. Uh, we also have the economics in our favor as we see declining prices of solar. We have low-cost natural gas at our disposal. I think we have a lot of tools to make great progress. Right, so I'll, I'll put your answer in this similar bucket to people who say, well, the United States isn't part of the Paris Accord, but many states are implementing the provisions of it anyway. Doug, you're an American running a Canadian company with operations in Canada and the United States. Your reaction to that question? Well, I, I, think, I think we should come back to, don't forget the country that's made the most progress at reducing CO2 emissions is the United States. So we, we shouldn't forget that. And, and the market worked because it did it without affecting reliability or affordability. Um, so we need to recognize this transition. I'd come back to China, too that China's had, the energy policy has lifted, I, I, I probably have the number not precisely right, but over 600 million people out of poverty. Um, we gotta come back to the three billion people. So the challenge for leaders across the world and political leaders across the world is how do you balance all of these needs? It cannot just be about climate, it also has to be about poverty, it has to be about efficient growth in the world. E even uh, the comment earlier about without strong economies, we can't do as much, and we know that. We know that's true with social issues, we know it's true with climate issues. So getting the balance right is absolutely key as we do this, and actually the technology around energy is improving rapidly, and it's reducing everything from greenhouse gas emissions to the cost of the products, and the market's actually working. We need to let it work. And in some places, it does need stimulus. That, that's always been the case, particularly to kickstart new ideas that business is not yet ready to grasp because of risk. You asked the question, would you like to, would you like to respond to the responses to your question? Um, I appreciate the response, especially hers. Um, but I, I really think um, the time scale is shifting. We don't have all that much time to worry about everything. I, th I think this is more drastic, and perhaps we should address this. Also, having a government who pulls out of the Paris Accord doesn't help. Uh, so, I mean, it's really at the, at, at the end, at the business leaders like yourself who can really make conscientious decisions. I mean, if we don't exist, uh, I mean, all as a race, I mean, I don't know what we're gonna do with the Fortune 500. <laughs> Doug, I think you know. I think you've been. I think you've been very uh, cl clear and and, are, and articulate on this this notion of balance. And so maybe I'll just try to ask the question of you in one one different way, which mm -hmm. is, he, he's representing a, a very loud and prominent perspective that no, you know, hey, it's too late for balance. It's too urgent for balance. And I I think you prudently reject that argument. And so I'll ask you. Where do you see the debate going constructively, or will it, like so many of our debates these days, not be constructive? 
Well, I, I, think, I think first of all, I think what we have to have is, is really open and good dialogue because, you know, the course, course of my career, I've gotten to travel and work in about 40 countries in the world. And unfortunately, uh, most of those do not look like Canada, the United States. They're developing nations where access to clean water and access to energy are something that don't usually exist today. So when we, we talk about what's happening in these places, we, these three billion people really do matter. Uh, and, and thinking, we have to figure out how do we actually fit all of these things together? Because for them, their life, the, I'll give you a simple story. I met an individual um, at a, a CEO event two years ago who manufactures tanks. Uh, his most common product is the five-gallon propane tank you use for your barbecue grill. And he's telling me about his business, and he said his biggest customer today is India, where they have a program to try to move 50 million people off cooking with dung. Uh, and the image he described is normally it's women in these households who go out in the day and collect dung. They transport it back to their home on the top of their head, and then they use it to cook their evening meal, and they die of lung disease. Hmm. When we sit here in Toronto, that doesn't feel like the real world. That's 50 million people. That's one and a half times the population of Canada, to put it into perspective. So that's why we have to have good dialogue and good decision making, because we, if we don't, we're not going to meet all of these needs. And, and I, I think it's a, very, uh, it's a very emotional debate, and it's a very technical debate but it makes it very difficult to have it in the right way, and I think it is a huge challenge for political leaders to manage all these constituencies. Felix, I want to ask you to have the last word and just give us the benefit of your global perspective. You're, you're, you're in business around the world. Policy around the world matters to your company. Give us your thoughts, please. Yeah, you know, just to concur with that, is I think climate change is really important. In June, we actually went to Vatican with many other energy uh, um, leaders and aside from the report, in my view, is this, this summer alone, I've been to 20 plus countries, many different cities. I was in Tokyo in July, 41.8 degrees. There is record temperature in Tokyo and for the last 50 years or whatever recorded history. That's Celsius, obviously. Sorry. I'm Please kidding. go on. No, I'm with you. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I can convert. Okay. Um, it's fine. Yeah. Second point is I was, I was in Hong Kong multiple times in the summer, and every time either I, before I arrive or after I leave, and there's a typhoon. So it seems like it's a typhoon before me or a typhoon after me. I was in Europe many, many times, whether it's in Stockholm, whether it's in Berlin, whether it's in Rome, record summer in, in Europe. I think the climate change issue is a real issue. That impact is huge. The, the bottom line I want to say is, it, it actually, it gets to the point is, is not about the debate. It gets to the point is we do have technology, innovation, and solution in place. All we have to do as the policymakers in the world is actually encourage and not to be the bottlenecks and obstacles to, to the technology and the innovation. Just don't stand in the way. Let the market play its role. It, it, it's the perfect place to end. Felix, Doug, Lynn, thank you so much. Adam, thank you. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Adam. Thank you.